Good. All right, it notifies you pretty yeah. loud. <laughs> I always like, um, yeah, like when it, like when you start recording, there's like continue or leave meeting. I always like ask, like, I always like about to like click leave meeting because it actually like warns like participants, like, like if they're not comfortable with recording, they can just leave the meeting. There's a button to leave the meeting and I always like almost click on that. Hi guys. Hi everybody. Hey everyone. Um, looks like we're just, um, people are just trickling in little by little. Yep. Jackie, is that background somewhere? Is that like, can we find that on Notion somewhere or? Uh, no, I can actually put it. This was actually designed by one of our alchemists. So I love <laughs> using a lot of the backgrounds. Um, yeah. We, we should just send it to us. We should put it as our backgrounds for the next uh, upcoming talks. That looks really cool. Yeah, feel feel free. Um, they, uh, they normally place it in Figma where they have the wallpapers. Hi everyone, right. so if you're joining us like for the first time or uh, in general, just feel free to say hello to all the other participants and also share where you're joining us from. Uh, it's really interesting for speakers uh, now that we are all virtual. I think uh, it's interesting for speakers to figure out that they have a diverse audience. Uh, it always gives us, uh, you know, an extra bit of courage to uh, give you as much uh, as many details as possible or, uh, you know, just have fun overall in the workshop. So feel free to say hi, uh, feel free to let us know where you are from, what are you doing this evening or morning, right? Hello, hello. Singapore. Oh, awesome. In Turkey. Oh, South Africa, awesome. See, this is fun to read, guys. <laughs> Hey, Sean. Sean's from my hometown in Syracuse. Nice. All righty. So I'm just going to um, do a short introduction and um, I'll let these two lovely ladies take, um, take over. So welcome everybody who um, uh, has been able to make it today. This is our second Alchemist workshop that we've been um, throwing at Covalent, which we're super excited. We're going to be introducing many more workshops. Um, this is a two-part series. So uh, this um, will be also um, available next week, which will make the announcement where we'll continue basically the second part of uh, bringing NFTs to, to life with uh, different topics. But yeah, super excited that we're getting more alchemists uh, doing workshops based on a lot of their expertise. And it's just gonna be like a wide variety of different skill sets that will be taught because it's been um, asked for. But yeah, no, I feel like this is just the beginning. It's gonna bloom into something beautiful and very excited that um, these guys have just been taking the initiative to wanting to teach the community how to do awesome things. And, and yeah, so I'll let you guys take it over from here. I'll turn my camera off. So yeah, welcome everybody. Thank you, Jackie. Welcome everyone to bringing NFTs to life uh, using Covalent. Uh, this is my second workshop um, as part of the um, Alchemist uh, Academy uh, program, which I know that we're having a announcement um, later next week. But I'm also doing this in collaboration uh, with Guy. And so I'm Jennifer. Um, I'm a software developer. Um, I work on a project called Mintgate. And Mintgate is also an NFT marketplace. It also has a lot of features, you know, such as like, token gate access. So I know a lot about the use cases of NFTs. And then Guy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Gyan Lakshmi. Uh, I'm also called uh, Gyan, popularly known as Gyan. And uh, I am uh, primarily working as a product manager currently, but uh, I'm also working as a smart contract developer, as a freelancer uh, for a couple of NFT projects. I think uh, four NFT projects and uh, uh, another one project, which is a fun uh, gaming project, which also uses Covalent, actually. And I'm also the ambassador for uh, various uh, layered one chains like uh, your near protocol, Algorand, Eternity, etc. 
uh, by profession i am a product manager but uh, by heart i am an educator i love to do meetups i love to educate the community uh, build videos answer questions and what not so even post the workshop if you feel like you want to build on something uh, you don't need to be a blockchain expert even if you are just a starter you are curious about how blockchain works feel free to always reach out to us and and you know we'll help you find the way so over to jennifer now awesome thanks gian so we're going to introduce um, you guys to NFTs uh, and Covalent. First, I'll talk about what are NFTs and some of the use cases behind them. And then Gion will talk about some of the technical aspects of NFTs and how you can actually develop them yourself. NFTs, yeah, NFTs are, what are NFTs? So NFTs um, are uh, non-fungible tokens. And there are digital certificates stored on the blockchain that represent a digital or physical asset. So the digital or physical asset is not stored on the blockchain itself. It just pretty much represents the asset. So this is just an example that I normally give to people about what are NFTs. So if you think about just like a JPEG itself, the JPEG um, or a photo, it's on its own. But if you like tie a digital the digital certificate to that JPEG, it becomes an NFT and it's verifiable, as you see here. For example, Beeple um, was sold for 69 million USD um, in the last couple of months. It was just like a um, comp compilation of photos and like the NFT represented that compilation of photos um, created by Beeple. V Friends is an NFT collection by Gary V, which is a really who is a very famous um, entrepreneur influencer on YouTube and on, on, on other platforms. Uh, and he created um, also artwork uh, that is tied to you know, these digital certificates, these NFTs. But interestingly, he also is allowing anyone who owns these NFTs to attend VCon to that. Uh, 2021. So now these NFTs not only represent this artwork, as you can see here, but it also represents like a ticket to actually a physical event that's happening at the end of the year. So how are NFTs like different from cryptocurrencies? In my last class, I talked about social tokens and social tokens are so cryptocurrencies that represent a creator, artist, or community. For example, Connie Digital is a hip hop artist, hip hop artist uh, based in New Jersey, USA, and he has a token named Hugh. If you go on Uniswap, you can take like 0.005 ETH um, and then buy this like 191 Hugh. So for example, I'm going to take um, a 0.005 ETH and this buy this 191. 91 Hue. And then if, say, Gion goes on the same platform and then takes her 0.005 ETH, she will also get 191 Hue. And all, like, our Hue, like my Hue, is the same as her Hue. And so these cryptocurrencies, one cryptocurrency, one Hue, is the same as another Hue. Cryptocurrencies themselves are something called fungible assets. They have the ability to swap evenly with an asset of the same type. They're practically interchangeable. So you have one ETH, it's one, one ETH equals one ETH, someone else's one ETH is the same. Same like social tokens are a form of a cryptocurrency. I have one hue, someone else that has one hue, it's the same value. But non-fungible assets or NFTs are assets that cannot be interchangeable. They're unique and different. So for example, I have one NFT. That NFT is not going to be the same as someone else's NFT. They're going to be different. And they're not like they're not the same because they represent you know, something different. So you might be thinking, like, what is an asset? Like, what can you make? Like, you have, like what can you make out of an NFT? So an asset is something that's very useful or valuable. It can be an object, you know, such as artwork or expertise. Pretty much anything like in life that you think is valuable, you can really tie with an NFT. Asset digitalization is when you create a digital version of physical analog assets. So for example, um, documents. You can create NFTs that represent um, a document in real life. Here are some examples of assets. So for example, you can, for example, videos. There's a platform called NBA Top Shot, 
It's a marketplace of NFTs that you'll know, verify NBA highlight clips. You can also create note, you can also like uh, digitize essays. Mirror.xyz is a site where you can mint NFTs for your essays. Music. Catalog.works is a marketplace where you can create NFTs that represent songs. So NFTs are not just about verifying artwork, but it also like you can also just verify you know, any type of asset that you can think of. Creators, as a result, like creators can now monetize in different ways using NFTs. One of the main themes that I talked about in the last class was that uh, creators using the blockchain, they have like more, um, they have more chances and just more opportunities to you know, develop their artwork um, out and like, completely own it without um, any like third parties um, and without, um, and they have like full ownership of like, their creative process. And NFTs really allow them to do that. Because imagine, um, instead of releasing a song with like a music label, you can now release a song as I release a song via an NFT that verifies um, that existence of that song. And then you can just you know, sell that NFT directly to a fan. And then that fan can then have the ownership of that song be represented in NFT. It really allows creators to not have like that middleman um, and really allows creators you know, to really launch um, their work without you know, any, uh, any middleman, but also allows them to have a direct relationship with fans because now they can sell whatever work that they have directly to their fans um, as opposed to going through some sort of agency, some sort of label um, to do it for them. And then fans themselves can now own different types of assets. So in the past, you know, a song, like in the past, like if you, like a creator release a song, that song probably is owned by the creator and then maybe a label. And then fans really didn't have a say on, they couldn't really own that song. They may could listen it, to it on Spotify or on other platforms, but they couldn't like necessarily own it. But now fans really have a chance to own different types of pieces of their work and really be able to influence uh, some, but be able to influence you know, how their creators work or to really just be more engaged with their creator. So asset ownership, um, so asset ownership, um, NFTs are blockchain tokens that represent um, an asset. You can trade, buy, and sell these assets like you would in the real world. Like I already mentioned, you can take and you can buy an NFT, and this NFT would represent your ownership of an asset, of a product, of a physical item. And you can just you know, trade this with other people. You can you know, buy like other NFTs. And then if you don't want that NFT anymore, you can also sell this on another marketplace and someone else who really believes in that product or that asset or really interested in it um, can, also, uh, can also buy it from you. So we already talked about some of the pros of blockchain and tokenization already, at least on, on the creator and fan relationship side, but there are also other, other pros um, as well. So first we are talked about um, ownership proof. If you have an NFT, because that's a digital certificate that's on the blockchain, it's proof that you actually own something. It's an immutable record uh, via a public distributed, uh, is it, it's an immutable record like on a ledger that pretty much says that you really do own this, this item, this asset. Anywhere can, anyone can buy this N these NFTs. So I'm pretty sure like you have been in situations where you couldn't buy or couldn't view something because you're in a, a different country from like where that product um, is made or where that product is distributed. So one example is that, for example, if you've been on YouTube and you're trying to like watch a video, you might be restricted. You might not be able to watch a video because you're in a in like you're in an area where that video you no know, hasn't had like, hadn't bought distributed distribution rights to other countries, but you no know, NFTs you can really like you can buy NFTs pretty much anywhere. There's really no deter territorial or even like age barriers. So anyone at any age um, can buy these NFTs. And there's also like there's also like 
technically quicker and cheaper transactions. I know like with gas costs um, kind of going, uh, gas costs kind of going up, at least on Ethereum, uh, I know that there has, like it has been kind of expensive to, to create your NFTs and also buy NFTs. But in the future, um, the idea is, uh, is minting on NFTs, like minting NFTs like on the blockchain and also like buying on the NFTs on the blockchain would just be quicker um, and cheaper than you know, buying assets um, elsewhere where there might be a KYC process. Um, there has to be some approval from some bank. The idea is eventually uh, buying you know, anything on the blockchain would be a lot quicker, a lot cheaper than buying it um, through just with fiat you know, through a whole bunch of third parties. And in the future, um, it would be easier to have like multiple owners. Uh, the technical term for this is called fractional ownership. So an NFT uh, can represent you know, percentages of an asset. So for example, you might have like a song and then there could be multiple NFTs that represent like a certain percentage. For example, you have like 10 NFTs that represent 10% you know, each of that song. So that really helps uh, NFTs and because NFTs are like, they prove that you have ownership and they're immutable. It's a lot easier for creators um, to mint NFTs uh, that you know represent certain percentages of an asset, be able to track um, all of the owners um, that own that song or that you know that creative piece. Um, and this is something that you know in my work that I've really seen a lot of. For example, there is um, a platform that actually does solve this problem. And because in the real world, in the music world, uh, you might have like hundreds of people who own like beats and parts of the song now from the producer to the creator. And it's really hard if you're just using just a regular database or a spreadsheet to kind of track who actually owns what of that song. Like a lot of things end up getting lost. So with NFTs, it's really, e it's much easier to track. It's also much easier um, if they end up wanting to transfer their ownership to someone else to just have like, all the information available on the blockchain and also like they can't like erase, uh, they can't erase like the data so that, so um, there always will be like an immutable record of like who owns what. So here's an example of how ownership would work. So as step one, tokenization is defined as a method to convert ownership rights um, and asset into digital token. So for example, say you want, you have like 200,000, right? Um, and then they can be converted into like 200,000 tokens um, where each token is equal to like 0.005% uh, share of the asset. Then um, these tokens are issued on one any you know, blockchain platform that can support like smart contracts, for example, near or Algorand or you know, any you know, blockchain that you can think of. So when a user buys like one token, it means that they buy like 0.005% of the assets ownership. Now, if someone um, if someone buys like 80,000 tokens, they own like 4% of the asset. If they buy all 200,000 tokens, um, they became 100% owner of that property. And so what do I think of the future of NFTs? I think like NFTs um, are just going to represent more than just artwork. As you already seen that there are examples with NBA Top Shot, Mirror, and Catalog where, where NFTs represent more than just like a piece of art. But now that like, I think that in the future, they will evolve into, represent, and into representing many different things. For example, one of the use cases is uh, NFTs representing gated content. So what you can do on a lot of these platforms now is you can create an NFT that just you know uh, that just has you know it represents an artwork, but behind it uh, you can also like have like unlock something called unlockable content. And that content can be a link uh, to like a website, a link to exclusive document. Um, it, can, it, have, it can be a lot of different things. Also, as a result, NFTs are almost becoming the OAuth um, in order to access something. So for example, now that, uh, for example, like Gary V uh, has his 
NFTs represent like a ticket to his conference. Now you can, like now you can have like NFTs represent tickets to shows. So, you know, if you have an NFT, um, that is when like you can, then you can like access a show. So I think that the more like token, this concept of token gate access would be something that a lot of people will be tinkering around with in the next couple of months. Another thing is just having more NFTs represent physical objects. I know it's a really big challenge right now uh, to have NFTs represent physical objects because you have to really think about like, how are you going to connect the data of like where the physical object is um, and with the NFT? But I know that there are different projects you now that are trying to solve a lot of those problems. So for example, I really envision a world where you go to the Nike store and then you can buy shoes from Nike. And then they'll also give you an NFT that represents that act, that specific shoe. I think the value here is that the if you have this NFT that represents this physical item, this shoe, you can also prove that it is authentic, uh, that it is that it is uh, real, and so it also helps with like counter, like anti counterfeiting as well. So I know a couple of projects on uh, that are helping like luxury brands to make NFTs, you know, with every single product that they sell, so that you know you can verify this luxury good as actually coming from the manufacturer if you also own that NFT. In the future, I also think NFTs will really help uh, with DeFi, decentralized finance. Remember the concept of you know, fractional ownership? I really do see that NFTs being able to be used um, for like physical products um, that you own, whether it's a house or something uh, where you can like split up the uh, ownership. So one example that um, I see in the space is like, well, there's one person who's trying to have NFTs represent deeds. And so deeds are, uh, are what can, deeds are the document that pretty much confirms your ownership. And in the future, what they wanna do is tie some a deed to an NFT. And as a result, I uh, like, an owner of a house can have an NFT that show like represents that shows that they own the house. And if they want to you know send, if they want to transfer their ownership to someone else, say for someone in the family or multiple people um, in the family, they can actually you know, send this NFT um, to them, or they can potentially like in the future like, create multiple NFTs and that like that represent you know certain percentages of the ownership of a house and then send it out to another you know, their family members or whoever they want to have like different uh, different ownership of the NFT. And as a recap, so as a recap, like what are NFTs? NFTs can represent a digital asset that is just unique. So an NFT, so an NFT itself is a unique representation of some sort of asset. Ownership of NFTs is recorded on the blockchain. So the digital certificate itself is record is put on the blockchain using a digital agreements called those like smart contracts. But the artwork itself or like the digital asset or digital, like physical asset is not on the blockchain. And ownership can also be easily transferred and traded uh, online using secure block chain contracts um, on the back end. So for example, if you have like an NFT, you can easily transfer it or trade it to someone else. Um, and that is powered by smart contracts. And NFTs are really becoming popular, right? Um, because they're, uh, have, they have been able to you know, represent, um, they, they haven't bought about as a secure way of creating digital ownership of a scarce material. So think about you know, NFTs and you know, representing some of these really, like really in demand assets, whether it's a video or it's an exclusive essay from a well-known creator, or just like, as you saw there, I saw in some of the examples, uh, people, uh, just like a collection of images of a really famous artist uh, and like it sold for $69 million. So it has become um, a way of really being able to verify that you own something that is really valuable in the market. And now with that, um, I'll have Gian talk about you know, NFT uh, standards and the techn technicalities of NFTs. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. I think that was a great overview of what are NFTs. 
uh, let me just uh, present my screen so it would be easier uh, for me to take over. All right, just give me a second. Okay, let me present my entire desktop while. All right, while my really extremely slow laptop is loading the slide. Uh, so the slide that uh, Jennifer already presented, um, I, I'll just walk you through that while this kind of comes up. Uh, the idea of uh, NFTs, as you, you have already uh, come to know, is to create an asset, uh, create a unique asset uh, on the blockchain just to ensure that uh, the ownership and the transfer of that asset are all quite transparent, right? So this is one of the... Uh, I mean, one of the uh, one of the struggles that artists kind of uh, deal with on a day to day basis, especially uh, those who are building digital art, right? How do you know which piece of art belongs to who, and uh, how can you safely transfer the ownership of that piece of art uh, from one artist to uh, a collector or one collector to another collector, right? Uh, these are some of the core problems that um, NFT is solving. That is, uh, having a non-fungible token represent a piece of art or uh, an ES, ENS name or uh, a particular uh, share percentage of ownership in a given uh, deed as uh, Jennifer had given an example. Now, when we uh, associate transferring ownership or uh, recording the information on the blockchain, right? When we associate all of these actions, we think of them as uh, some kind of functionality associated with the NFTs, right? Now, when we uh, talk about functionality associated with any kind of uh, uh, digital media art or uh, uh, tokens, these come in the form of standards. So standards are nothing but your rules uh, associated with how this particular entity would function. Right. Now, a um, couple of standards uh, that are defined for NFT, some of the popular ones are ERC 721. This is a standard that describes how a particular NFT created on the Ethereum blockchain would function. What are the functions associated with this? Right. Uh, how can you transfer it? How can you safely transfer it from one user to another? How can you mint it? That is, how can you create it, right? And how can you store the metadata? How can you set the token URI or metadata or associated information with the NFT on the blockchain? These are all the different standards associated with this particular, with a particular NFT. Some of the popular standards are ERC-721, which has been, I think, one of the legacy standards and uh, uh, has a pretty robust uh, system associated with it. ERC-1155 is one of the new, uh, relatively new standards by Ethereum again. It allows to create both fungible and non-fungible tokens. There are certain different kind of rules associated with the ERC-1155 standard, which is very useful for creating collection-based NFTs. Couple of other standards that are also coming into picture now is HRC-721. It is a harmony-based NFT. One of the projects that I'm working on is based on an HRC 721. And another popular NFT standard that is coming up again is NEP 171, which is a, a standard of NFT described by the NEAR protocol. It allows up to 50 artists to split royalties amongst them. This is one of the unique features of NEP 171. There are also a couple of other uh, rules and features that are associated with these standards. But when you want to create an NFT, you have to choose one of the existing standards or of course maybe create your own standard on a protocol in order to associate your created nft with a particular set of rules so this is the first thing when you think about when i want to deploy my own nft what standard should i choose uh, you can answer this question depending on the kind of blockchain protocol that you're interested to choose the kind of rules that you want associated with your NFTs, the kind of NFTs themselves that you would want to create, whether individual ones or collections, etc. Okay, 
now uh, how do the nfts go up for sale what happens in the background right so the first thing that that you need to do is have an nft contract right i'll be showing you these things uh, in uh, uh, just today as a small demo as well uh, but uh, if you want to put up create your nft and put them up for sale what would actually uh, require uh, what would a marketplace do so this is more like what does an nft marketplace do right uh, first the nft creator or the owner would deploy an erc721 or whichever nft standard you decide to choose that kind of contract on the blockchain of your choice when you are deploying this you need to provide two simple things one is the name of your nft and another is a symbol using which your nft would be recognized now this could be this could happen two ways that you can act as a mediator who's creating the nfts on somebody else's behalf and then give royalties to them as a, uh, as they would be the artist or the creator or there are many platforms that facilitate artists to come and mint their own nfts right their artists don't have to do anything much they don't have to be technically well versed uh, it would be very intuitive they'll just have to click a couple of buttons but all they would require is to have an account on the blockchain of their choice and have some amount of core tokens of that particular chain so they can mint an nft so many of the marketplaces are now moving to uh, artists minting their own nfts now uh, the first when we deploy the contract we get an address of the nft that is how your uh, art that goes un under this nft would be recognized a unique address the second step is to mint the piece of art or collectible one of the important distinctions between step 1 and step 2 is that unless you mint a token you are not creating an nft in the first step you are only getting a unique identifier for your nft or your set of nfts that you are going to mint under that particular contract umbrella just deploying the contract does not mean you have created an nft you need to mint the tokens because each of the nfts are nothing but non fungible tokens right so you need to create the tokens and for each of the nfts you will be giving some kind of unique uh, id right because uh, each of them would be having some unique image or some unique audio some unique video depending on whatever kind of nft you are minting right so they would be stored on some location uh, whether it could be a centralized location or a decentralized location depending on where you want to store them on the internet they would be stored somewhere digitally and that storage you will have to pass when you are minting that particular collectible art or collectible so there is a mint function that i'll show you very soon uh, the third of course once you have minted a token then you can sell that particular piece of nft you can put it up for sale so as a creator as an owner you can put it up for sale or uh, the or as a uh, as a as somebody who has already collected an nft obviously the other two steps have been done earlier for you so you can just directly put it up for sale on any marketplace which accepts the nfts of the kind you have created and which has the ability or which has that particular blockchain protocol integrated within them so you can choose a marketplace of your choice where based on the kind of nft you have minted uh, the popularity of the marketplace uh, the support for a particular blockchain protocol etc so now we have told that this whole workshop is about uh, bringing nfts to life using covalent right so i think it would be incomplete if we don't talk about covalent and how it comes into into the picture right now with one with an nft there are several uh, there are several touch points associated with that nft right an nft is a unique piece of um, art or Uh, uh, audio video uh, a unique domain name or or, or um, uh, something on those lines whichever uh, whatever you can imagine an nft to be right uh, the idea is that for that unique entity there are, there is going to be certain information associated with that particular entity 
So let me show you. Uh, I have a marketplace that I have opened. So you can see that here is a testnet uh, mint base marketplace, right? Mint base is a marketplace for NFTs uh, built on top of Near. And I have logged in using my testnet account. You can see there are different types of NFTs. There's art, there's DeFi, there's passion, there's membership and whatnot, right? Now, each of these NFTs, for example, lost in this lost at the sea, right? If I click on this, uh, is this is showing what is the price at which it is put up on sale. There is also certain other information associated with the NFT. For example, what is the split revenue, right? 2.5% would go to mint base from the sale. 87.5% would go to the uh, this particular artist or whatever this particular to whoever this particular address belongs to. There is a transaction ID. Uh, this is probably using which the NFT was deployed on the testnet. There is a storage gateway. This is the storage that I was talking about. This is probably where this NFT is stored, uh, this digital piece of art, right? There could be more information related to this NFT, like who was the artist who built this, uh, what is the, uh, you know, some, some description about the NFT, uh, and whatnot. So there could be different type of information that is associated with an NFT. For example, I, I'll show you some, some more. So uh, here is an NFT for which I have some metadata stored on uh, uh, cloud. Now this, this is an image. So there is a name for the image. There is a description, the image link, uh, the name of the artist, the creation date, there could be a website associated with this. And as Jennifer mentioned, some of the NFTs could be uh, redeemable NFTs. That is, you can actually redeem the physical product. It could be a physical painting that you could redeem if you own this NFT. So maybe another link that talks about how you can redeem uh, the actual painting, right? All of these are known as metadata. That is data associated with this particular NFT. Now, if you are creating a marketplace like this, you need all of the metadata that is associated with that particular NFT to show to your users as to what, are, what is the data associated with this NFT, right? And of course, you also need, uh, suppose somebody logs in, you also want to show them what in all NFTs did they mint. So what in all NFTs are their uh, address associated with? What in all did they mint? What in all do they own in their wallet, right? All of this different kind of information would be required. This is where Covalent comes into picture, right? Now, uh, Covalent is a very uh, powerful tool which brings, brings in unified APIs for you to get insights into the data points associated with different blockchain. One of the use cases that we're talking about today is NFTs, but there are so many other use cases where you, you need to understand what is the data that is associated with this particular account address on the blockchain. What are the different kind of transactions that are happening with a particular account address? What, uh, what, what, how many number of transactions failed? How many number of transactions succeeded? How many people have actually sent uh, or called a particular contract, um, you know, or called a particular contract address? There are, there are just infinite use cases to how you can use this data and how you can consume this to improve your uh, application for your users, especially when it's a decentralized application. This is where Covalent comes into your picture, right? So why Covalent, right? Uh, why do we need to figure, uh, analyze this data? Why do we need this data in the first place, right? Blockchain applications uh, have been uh, in picture, I think since about 10 years now, uh, the dApps or decentralized applications that we build on top of blockchain are similar to our web applications, but of course built with some other protocols and uh, some other features that are unique to the uh, to the uh, use case itself. But today, or uh, the more and more users have started using these applications, we have realized that there is a huge gap in terms of how do we read the data? How do we get the data associated with these applications, right? So blockchain data can be quite overwhelming to read on just on explorers. So far, we were highly dependent on explorers. Like for every blockchain, you have a different explorer. Like you have Etherscan for Ethereum related blockchain. You have BSC scan for Binance Smart Chain. You have a near explorer. You talk about a chain and they have their own explorer, right? 
imagine all of this data getting uh, converged into one single place right that would be such a uh, such a boon to have now second important uh, uh, issue is that how do we derive insights on how people are using my particular blockchain application right how do we derive insights on how a particular protocol or a chain is performing right there are always so many questions should i use near protocol over avalon chain should i use ethereum over bsc chain the, everybody is trying to figure out what is the best chain for their use case but how do you get these performance numbers all of it in bulk right this is all just data that you need to retrieve from blockchain the third and one of the most important things for people who are into trading right how do you calculate your aggregate historical balances how do you calculate your profit and loss across various protocols right and last but not the least one of the popular and upcoming use cases we have been talking about so far nfts right how do you get the nft metadata how do you understand what are the transactions that have happened related to an nft how do you record this particular transactions how do you understand um, how you can add certain user information and retrieve certain user information from the nft metadata right this is where covalent can come converging all of these use cases into offerings in the form of apis you can use apis to get data from the different blockchains you don't have to go to individual explorers now you can use the data that is coming from the apis to get insights on the performance of the different chains right you can use these apis to aggregate historical balances show profit and loss statements for different chains but in the same dashboard right and of course you can use these apis to fetch information related to nfts and display in your marketplace how does covalent work i have spoken so much about the use cases let's take a quick look at how it works so you see the apis that are exposed to the user this is the first and the only touch point of the user right everything else that you see from the covalent symbol that is right at the middle everything else is taken care uh, all of it on the left side is being taken care by covalent we don't have to worry about setting up the nodes getting the data from the different chains going to the explorers etc so the api endpoints are exposed to the user there are three categories of api endpoints class a class b and class c i'm not going to go into the depth but you can see each class comprises of certain uh, elements that are clubbed together and then uh, api endpoints are exposed for that users you hit the api uh, endpoint and ask for some data some information covalent hits the nodes and gets the information from each of the particular chains that it supports simple right uh there are multiple chains that are supported by covalent uh right from polygon uh, both mainnet and testnet are supported avalanche both mainnet and testnet support is there ethereum mainnet support is there bsc mainnet support is there there is upcoming support for other interesting blockchains as well near i think moonbeam is uh in the very near future probably a couple of days matter of couple of days and you can see that almost every other blockchain that we can think of which is having popular use cases are uh, being supported by covalent so you don't have to worry about uh, and uh, as the ecosystem is changing covalent is adapting to uh, to support many more chains as they are coming up right so you don't have to worry about whether a particular chain will be supported or not it if if there is demand if there are applications uh, it would definitely be supported by covalent all right so uh, we have seen a lot of theory and uh, i hope you have all understood what nfts are now uh, the popular saying is show me the money but here i think we are all interested to see the nfts so let's go back to uh, my slow running browser and show you how you can create your own nfts and uh, uh, take a look at them on uh, the covalent uh, 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 online uh, api documentation right so here um, uh, you will you are seeing a very uh, simple smart contract uh, called uh, covalent demo right uh, and uh, uh, the i'm using the erc721 uh, standard to create the nft over here right so i'm not going to go deep into the smart contract but the just to uh, just an fyi i'm using an editor called remix editor right i'm going to deploy this smart contract and the chain that i'm going to be using is the avalanche uh, a blockchain called avalanche and uh, i'm going to be using the testnet which is called the fuji c chain 
so as i said in order i have already compiled the uh, contract so um, what as i said the two parameters that you would require to create your nfts are the name and the symbol for your nft so uh, please bear with me if the font is a little small uh, i'll try to zoom in but uh, i think to my vein remix is really not that user friendly so i'm going to call this as a uh, um, covalent uh, demo work okay w okay and i'm going to give the symbol as cdw right and i'm i'm going to deploy uh, okay so let me just change the environment to a uh, launch okay i hope this works let me just cross check okay i'm going to be using metamask uh, so this transaction would have to be approved on metamask so you can see that the chain that i have chosen is the avalanche fuji c chain uh, it is a testnet for uh, um, avalanche and uh, i have already uh, requested some avax so i have it on my uh, account already uh, so let's just refresh this and do an injected web3 okay uh zoom is making this really slow so if you are not sure why i am pausing is because the account name account address over here has not changed yet what i'm expecting is for this to reflect the account that is present on metamask so if you see the account address that is there on metamask uh, for the particular account that i've chosen it is different from the account address that was there on remix so uh, so you can see it starts with 0x5d51 right Uh, whereas the account address that was on remix was 0x58d something so that means it's still not connected to the avalanche fuji c chain uh, which is my purpose of doing this so so i apologize for this speed unfortunately uh, in my side of the world <laughs> bangalore india it's raining cats and dogs here so the network is like incredibly slow yeah maybe gian uh there i while like it's you're waiting there was a question about like covalent um apis i can read out to you uh like how can we examine nfts transferred to wallets on different blockchains like ethereum xdai or covalent api and what detailed information uh will we be able to access when indexing nft wallets with the covalent api i did send that did send them some links to the nft metadata and key token ids and key transactions um apis but i was wondering now if you have anything to add to that question uh yeah uh is there is a question there on the chat uh yeah i uh if you look at the q and a um and answered um it is listed there oh is it okay i'm trying to figure out yeah i'm trying to click on the q and a but it's not opening <laughs> okay all right so uh let's try another oh, okay if no i was planning to think of another hack I'll see if I can. I can actually post it. We post it on oh, the chat yeah. again, so you can see. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So the address has changed now, and the network is on. All right. Ah, uh, so I'm going to deploy this NFT equivalent demo workshop CDW. So this ah, uh, the way that I'm doing it, this entire if you are finding this a bit painful <laughs> this is not the only way to do this uh, you have other ways to deploy your nft and uh, uh, take a look at the information as well you can use uh, uh, inbuilt suits like truffle or a uh, hard hat or anything of that sort uh, but remix is actually supposed to be the fastest and the best way for those who are you know uh, developing or learning about nfts for the first time uh, but obviously it's not fast on my laptop so that's a bit of a contradiction but you can see that uh, this contract that is being deployed uh, so uh, it is being created now so you can see that there is an ether scan transaction that came through that means uh, the contract is created uh, so let's if you want to take a look at this okay so you can 
you see that the metadata, et cetera, is uh, published, right? So what that means is now, uh, now we have done the first step. That is, we have got an NFT. We have got an NFT contract, uh, which is uh, which is having a particular contact address and I've copied that, uh, you know, uh, value to the clipboard. Now uh, you can, okay, we, what we can do is we can just look at this, we can look at this itself, whatever has been created for us. Uh, let me just copy this, con this account address. Okay, what I have done is now I've copied the account address of my account using which I have deployed this contract. And I already had my Covalent APIs page open and I have my API key that I've plugged in here. Uh, please do not copy my API key. Only half of it is visible anyways. You can create your own API key by going to covalenthq.com. It asks you to either sign up. I mean, it asks you to sign up. If you haven't already created an account, you need to sign up. Uh, you give your email ID and password. And once you have that, then uh, you should be able to get your API key, which you need to plug in here in order to uh, make these calls. So I'm going to think uh, work on a simple call that is get token balances for address. That is a class A endpoint, right? Uh, the address that I'm going to be using is the address that I copied just now, my account address. The chain ID, if you can see here for different chains, the chain ID is there. So I'm going to be using 43113, which is the uh, for Fuji C chain testnet, right? For the NFTs, uh, that is Boolean, I'm going to give true. That means give me all the NFTs as well. So this is uh, an API for getting token balances for address, right? So you can get the token balances for a particular address. If you remember, NFTs themselves are tokens. They are non-fungible tokens, right? So I want the I want what and all NFTs does this particular account hold and voila. Okay, it's already here. So you can see the response that has come from the Covalent API for my particular address that I had on MetaMask, right? Now you can see what and all does it have. It has an Avalanche coin that I deployed, right? And this is the uh, address for that. It has some other uh, uh, Avalanche uh, ERC20 coins that I had deployed, right? You can um, ignore all of this. Now, what we are interested is actually in the NFTs, right? So here you can see that in this particular contract name called Covalent Demo, something I had deployed um, earlier, is the type is NFT. So you can filter out this data using the type of the data. Now you can see that this has a token URL, right? This describes or gives the metadata of this particular NFT. Now, what is interesting about this API itself is that it gives you the metadata right here. You can see who created this particular uh, NFT, who was the owner, what is the image that this particular NFT is representing. Okay, So if I try to copy this and paste it on my browser, right, uh, I should be able to get the image right away of the NFT that is representing this. So this is the data that I'm going to extract and use on my marketplace. So if you see this marketplace, here is the digital art, here is the image. Where do you get this data from? You can get this data from this particular API, right? You can get the other details as well. Name of this image, it's called colors, a, a description, a rainbow a day makes the doctor go away. Okay, these are random descriptions added by me. Uh, so, but you see uh, this image, it is, we can straightforward retrieve the image and the data associated with it, this image. We can also get the owner who minted this particular token. Right. So here is information about NFTs that you can easily get from uh, uh, this API. Right. And you can also get some other data using the ERC20, other ERC20 token balances as well. Uh, the contract that I deployed recently, because I have not minted any tokens, I'm not getting the data yet. So once I mint some tokens, I will also be getting the updated data for that particular token as well. So it is very simple to do this. And of course, you can write scripts around this API uh, to retrieve the data from the API and then choose whichever uh, you would be interested to kind of, uh, uh, whichever parameters you are interested in your particular application. So you can add so much more data in the metadata and use that metadata to add conditions like uh, uh, the fractional ownership conditions, royalty conditions, all of those conditions you can add in your metadata and then get that back into your, feed that back into your NFT marketplace to distribute the royalties to the different artists accordingly. So yeah, I think uh, uh, we are dot on time, uh, seven, uh, okay, so just five minutes left. And uh, I just wanted to 
uh, as uh, Jacqueline had already mentioned, I just wanted to share that we have a part two of this workshop as well, where we are going to be actually writing this smart contract. Today, I just showed you what it is. I'm going to be walking you through every line, every step of the smart contract, how you can write your own smart contract, how you can create those different accounts that I already have them created on my Avalon chain. You can deploy the smart contract and then we'll be writing some small scripts using Covalent APIs to retrieve the data from the Covalent API and display it on our own marketplaces. So basically we will be getting our hands dirty uh, and we'll be uh, working hands-on on building something in the next workshop. Uh, and yeah, last but not the least, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we have such a, a diverse audience joining us from so, uh, so many different parts of the world. Uh, uh, I think earlier I forgot to mention that I, I am myself joining from Bangalore, India. So uh, I know that a couple of other folks also I noticed are from India. We have folks from Singapore, Turkey, uh, US and all over the globe. So uh, thanks everyone for, for sparing an hour uh, of your day, of your time. And I hope that uh, you have learned about NFTs a little bit about you know behind the behind the scenes of how an nft uh, functions and i hope you are equally excited to attend the next part of the workshop as well which is going to uh, help you build this behind the scenes uh, from an nft as well as from a data perspective right um right. quick quick uh, question i think we had um uh i guess like one or two quick questions which i was wondering if it was okay if you had time to answer so if you sure. look in the chat Ilmira asked um, if you could provide any use cases with uh, film financing via, via NFTs and crypto. I think that might be a question. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh... And then Honor asked... Film financing via NFTs and crypto? I don't know if that's a question or if it's a comment, but um, I did okay. paste honors question where he asked um how can we examine nfts transferred to wallets on different blockchains like ethereum or xdai with a covalent api um so that's just one part of the question nfts transferred to wallets on different blockchains like ethereum or xdai with covalent api so uh, you have a uh, um so for nft uh, nft uh, examining the nft transfers so transfers are nothing but your transactions right uh, uh, transactions related to your nfts you may um, you may sell it once and then somebody else buys it and then you put it for sale again somebody else buys it so the this entire basically the life cycle that is associated with nfts i hope that's what you're referring to when you say transfers transferred right so for this there is an api on covalent known as a uh, uh, NFT transactions, you can use that API to find out what were the different transactions that are associated with a particular NFT uh, NFT address. What detailed information will be able to access when indexing NFT wallets uh, with the Covalent API? So uh, when you say detailed information, uh, again, it is totally dependent on what your use cases, use cases right? Uh, for some folks, detailed information requires information to the level of what is stored in their metadata? Uh, who are uh, who are the different people who held this particular NFT? Uh, was this NFT burnt at any point in time? What are the different token IDs associated with a particular NFT address? Right? Uh, these could be just some uh, kind of data that comes to my mind when associated with NFT. And for all of this, Covalent provides API. So you can see under class A endpoints, you have four endpoints. Uh, actually, you have three. And the token balances, I consider it as one of the endpoints that can help with NFT as well. So you can use all of these endpoints. One is external NFT metadata, get NFT token IDs, get NFT transactions. All of this you can use uh, as a, as a, from using the Covalent API. Now, the other question regarding the chains, OK? You have to always remember that till now there isn't a, a very a very robust use case use case of transferring NFTs from one chain to another. Okay, uh, because when the standards change, we don't really know how it will work. For example, if you have deployed an NFT on Ethereum uh, chain, you can't even if it is and you have an NFT deployed on BSC chain. Uh, and even if both are ERC-721, they are in no way similar to each other. Only their standards might be the same, but the NFTs themselves 
are stored, their ownership, all their associated data is stored on a particular chain. So if you see in Covalent, all of the APIs, uh, especially the class A endpoints, all require you to give a chain ID, which means it will get your data associated with that particular chain only. If you want to do cross protocol analysis, you need to make the individual calls from the chains, get the data and then do the analysis, data analysis from your end. It won't, Covalent is not for analyzing the data. It is for fetching the data. Once you fetch the data, it is up to you as to what analysis you want to uh, do. Okay. Uh... Yeah, Elmira asked a question about uh, finance. Yeah, I can answer that question. Um, any use cases with film financing via NFTs and crypto? There actually is Elmi Elmira. There's a project called Mogul Productions that actually does just that. They are um, using, like, they actually are a DeFi solution to fund uh, independent films. Uh, they haven't used NFTs um, to, like, raise funds for these films quite yet, but they just recently launched um, NFTs so that you can actually use them to access um, we access uh, different films. Um, you can vote for different films um, to get fun get them funding. Um, also, you can also, like, get, like, posters, uh, speaking roles, like red carpet tickets um, if you buy those NFT passes. But yeah, definitely, I would definitely have you check out like Mogul, Mogul Productions. Like that's really their um, essence is like decentralized film financing. Um, I think there was one more question um, in the Q&A. Uh, so Prim Kumar asked, if a musician creates his artwork and sells it in the form of an NFT, is there a chance of distributing art, which it is in a digital file by people who download the artwork and then use it as an NFT? Yeah, I I, uh, I can answer this question or Jennifer, if you want to take it. Yeah, um, just your artwork, just one second, I'm just gonna have to read it, make sure um, there's a chance. Okay, yeah, I can- I can uh, answer I can, it, yeah. And then I'll, I'll tag on. <laughs> yeah, sure. So uh, actually, this is a great question, right? Uh, for uh, and this this example applies to everybody. Uh, it could be an artist who creates a digital uh, painting and uh, uh, wants to sell it in the form of NFTs. Uh, there is a chance of distributing the artwork, which is in the digital file, by the people who downloaded the artwork, right? Uh, this is uh, this is a typical like you know trust issue, right? Uh, this is what blockchain is actually set out to solve. Uh, now, the idea of NFTs is that, um, and the best way to do this is, now, uh, let me get to the solution first. The solution is that the artist should store their NFTs, uh, their digital images, or the music, audio file, whatever they have created, first of all, in a decentralized storage, right? If it's a centralized storage, someone can easily download it and use it and claim proprietorship. See here, it's uh, it's not about how many people own that particular piece of file. It's about how is their ownership or proprietorship verified, right? Because that is what is important. Like I can own whatever this background is there, right? This library background. Uh, I can say that I own this, but you will try to find a way to verify whether I actually own this. Now, this is where your NFTs being minted on blockchain comes into picture. How do you verify who's the actual creator, who is the actual owner of this particular piece of work, right? That's why it is minted on the blockchain to record the ownership of that particular piece of work. Now, if somebody downloads this and distributes this, this is the same as piracy, right? Uh, when somebody, uh, you have movies that get uploaded online and then people just watch it using whatnot means of, you know, different websites and whatnot. But it is still piracy, right? And eventually there, uh, there are laws around pi piracy, etc. So this is the same case as, as that. If a musician creates their artwork and wants to sell it in the form of NFTs, they have to ensure that they are storing their artwork or their uh, piece of entity on a decentralized storage, uh, mint it on top of the blockchain, preferably using a marketplace or using a minting place that lets them mint it so that particular piece of artwork then gets connected to their wallet, that this particular wallet owns this particular NFT. Now, whoever downloads that piece of file from the uh, IPFS or the decentralized storage, 
the ownership of that particular piece of work would always be marked to whoever minted it. So this is the best solution at this point in time. And the use of this is for the users, for the collectors who are collecting this particular NFT. They can verify that this NFT is claimed to be owned by someone who has actually created it or who, uh, you know, the, the authenticity rather, this is the word I was searching for. Authenticity of that particular entity is verified using blockchain. This is the whole point of NFTs to verify somebody's authenticity or that entity's authenticity and safely transfer it from one person to another. So the ownership can always be verified by whoever is collecting it or buying it or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, awesome. Jennifer can add. Yeah, yeah, I think that was an amazing um, explanation, uh, like the value of you know, still minting an NFT um, on the blockchain, even though you no know, someone can technically, you know, still uh, mint the same item or you know distribute it um, out, like distribute it one like once they have it. But I think that there are going to be more like tools, like at least for gated content um, that will really help you know, secure the distribution of some of this uh, some of this work. So for example, you might have, have like an NFT and then you can gate it behind the NFT you have like you can gate it with like an MP3 file. And I know that there are going there are more tools where um, you can you know gate an NF like gate um, like an MP3 file right with an NFT and you need to like own that NFT to even access the MP3 file and like you there's no way for you to find out um, where that MP3 file is or like download it to share it with someone else so I think like as time goes on like the tools will be more built out so that it will be more difficult um, to share uh, something of this work um, especially on the gated side maybe if it, if the art piece itself um, is uh, shown on the NFT marketplace, uh, NFT marketplace, um, it, it'd be easy to you know, just take a screenshot of it. Um, but I think the value going back, you know, what um, Gian mentioned was that you can tie uh, the original art piece, right, or the art piece of um, a creator by looking at that contract address and also that token ID and associating it. Um, that is the one that is associated with uh, that creator. But I think, yeah, in the future, no gated content um, and that, the how like unlockable content works, um, it will, will like how that it will, like evolutionize um, that, yeah, that will really help you know, some solve like some of those problems. All right, I, I want to be, oh, sorry, I want to be oh. mindful of your guys this time too. There are more questions coming up. So um, if you guys um, either want to let them know what your like handles are at the bottom so they can ask you, or if you're I mean, more than welcome to stay and answer the questions that they have in the chat. It's uh, totally up to you guys, but I want to make sure I'm being respectful of our um, uh, the ladies' time as well. Yeah, I'm just going to put my Discord and my Twitter uh, handle because I think some of the questions related to collateral and DeFi, the conversation might just go on and on. And I want to be mindful of the participants' time as well. And it's pretty much going to be dinner time on my end. So uh, if I'm just let free, I'll just like talk a lot. So I'll have a conversation offline. That would be better. Uh, Elmira, I, I, I know Elmira, so I, I can always finger on WhatsApp and uh, chat with her. I know she has a lot of questions in the NFT space, so uh, I can take that up. Right, perfect. So um, yes, everyone, Jennifer and um, Gana went ahead and put their handles at the bottom if you guys want to reach out to them so they can answer your questions. This was such an informative session. I feel like I learned a lot too, so I'm so excited for the second one. <laughs> uh, but I really wanted to thank you two for your time and the knowledge that you've been able to pass on to, to everybody. I can see that you've been sparking up some discussions already just from the chat and uh, really looking forward to um, just seeing what everybody else learns and is able to apply. But thank you to our attendees as well for participating and for coming to the session. We are looking forward to seeing you uh, for part two that will be next week and for future sessions that as well. And big shout out to uh, Snow.8KA Karina, who's been organizing and helping these workshops also come to fruition and come to life. But uh, yeah, and to any other alchemists and OGs who were able to attend and support. Um, but all right, you guys have an amazing rest of the day. Enjoy your dinner. <laughs> and uh, we'll chat soon. Chat soon. Have a nice day, everyone. Yeah, have a nice day. Or good night, wherever you're joining. Yeah. <laughs>